Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Black Op Radio. This is Leno Sanic and today we have the pleasure of being joined by Dave Ratcliffe. Hello Dave. Hi Len, glad to be here. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. You are one of the people I've always looked up for. You're very well informed and in tune with things and um, of course we had a mutual appreciation of Fletcher Prouty and I think that's, you know, pretty good company to be in. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, why I wanted to talk to you today is that I like to have you on at least a couple of times a year to help promote your groundbreaking book, Understanding Special Operations. But today is the, well, the 24th is Fletcher Prouty's birthday. Of course, people always talk about when, you know, when someone passes away in a funeral and those dates, but I'd like to, to, to uh, do a show on his birthday to, to keep the spirit of Fletcher Prouty's disposition alive as he worked in a very important position he didn't just give away secrets but as he said he tried to level the playing field every now and then when he just saw things were so slanted and so out of line and he was one of a kind so i guess we can start off today with discussing a little bit about your meeting with fletcher your videos your book and if we if we start with understanding special operations for those who don't know too much about the book uh, by the way, which is available here at Black Op Radio, if you uh, use the order page, the orders go straight to Dave, so you get this book right from the author. So that's a, a benefit. The book, Understanding Special Operation, is a culmination, I think, of, of those days. You were there in Fletcher's home, interviewing him, discussing things, but then letters back and forth that helped shape, shape this thing. And I think it's a must-read for anyone who has read The Secret Team. This is the companion because you went there, I guess, loaded with questions after reading The Secret Team. You said, well, you've said these things, Fletchers. Can you elaborate? And that's just what he did. It was a wonderful opportunity to talk to an author of a highly dense, very compressed information book, The Secret Team, and uh, a, a primary writing about his own primary experiences in World War II and beyond. <clears throat> and I knew a mutual acquaintance, John Judge, who knew Fletcher quite well. And I told John about making a uh, reader form from articles that he'd written at that time that were published in Freedom Magazine that became the book that was published right after the Oliver Stone movie came out. I can never keep the title on this straight. He originally thought of calling it the Saigon Solution, but Len, what was the actual final title? Yeah, JFK, Vietnam, the CIA, and the plot to assassinate John F. Kennedy. There you go. Originally by Carroll Publishers, and then I think it was reprinted, republished or reprinted. But I went because I had the opportunity to talk with him directly in person. He was, interest, he was interested that I was interested in him. And I spent a number of months with a highlighter after I made a Xerox copy. Actually, all I had was a Xerox copy of the secret team because at that point it was completely out of print. And uh, the copy I received, got was from Tom Davis, a bookseller in Monterey Bay, California, who was May Brussels' primary book contact for any books that she received and got for her studies. And Tom gave me a copy of this, and I went through it with a fine-tooth comb and made a lot of notes of things that were, in whatever way, especially interesting to me. And then I typed all that up, had about 20 pages of excerpts, maybe just a couple of lines, maybe more than a paragraph or two, without any... Necess I forget how I even organized them. I think they were just organized chronologically as I'd gone through the book, but I had an idea of a lot of different things that I would like to, if possible, ask him about, and we, I was there in May of 18, 1989, uh, stayed at a relative's house of mine near to where he lived in Alexandria, Virginia, went over to his house every day. We spent the first full day just talking and getting to get a sense of each other in person, and he showed me things like the Christchurch New Zealand extra paper that he found on the street the morning, Saturday morning, when he was in Christchurch coming back from his heading up of, or uh, I guess chaperoning a VIP tour to the South Pole. 
and we looked at the original paper that he had found on the street that day and the incongruities in there that he's written about and talked about at different times and that there's some of that in this book. <clears throat> but then we had basically three days. We recorded 11 half hours of recorded tape, starting with, I wanted to establish some kind of background of his own uh, military service and, and life's experience, autobiographical uh, summary in some ways so that people could have some kind of sense of who he was and what he'd been doing. At the time that I did all this, I had no idea that I would necessarily turn it into, into a book. I was primarily very interested to, with the opportunity to talk with him and to record our conversation, which I did. And I thought of it at the time just in terms of, well, what makes sense just as far as making these recordings go? Well, let's make the first one about his life. Let's make the second set of tapes about his book, The Secret Team. And then there was two more tapes at the end. There was three tapes and three tapes and two tapes. Most of them were 90 minutes. Um, the last two tapes were focusing more, uh, starting with the Kennedy assassination and then going out to things that were somewhat more expansive than that. And so it was. that was in 1989. It was 10 years later that I finally decided, well, I guess I'll try to actually make this be a book that I publish myself. And I used pay, uh, Adobe software that at that time was for making books. I uh, made transcripts. I'd, I'd made original raw transcripts, text transcripts of the recordings, sent them back and forth to Fletcher in the mail so that he could write, mark them up. And he took the opportunity to add in a few things that he hadn't said when we were talking. And I tried to make them clean them up so they were grammatically correct and, and readable without losing the sense of what we were saying in the conversations. A lot of times, of course, in a spoken word conversation, sentences are incomplete. Uh, ideas start, but then in midstream, somebody changes where they think they're going, and so the sentence won't necessarily cohere. But I, I went through and spent time trying to make the written transcript be more easy to read and still retain all that we had covered. And, and we went back and forth with that enough. And finally, in 1999, I found a publisher in uh, a book printer in, uh, I think it was Wisconsin, and printed up more than 700 copies. And I'd already been making this website for about five years. And I decided, okay, I'll put a form of this out there so people can see it. It'll be in search engines. It'll be picked up if you're looking for something to do with the Dulles Jackson Korea report or whatever else that you might be searching on that would actually be in this book. And also figuring, well, some people will still want a real book that they can hold in their hands. So it was a, a, a very uh, amazing opportunity and uh, it grew into something much more by the time it actually became the book. Well, it's unparalleled because the thing is, there's a lot of people writing about the CIA or the Pentagon or the Kennedy assassination. And it's like, well, I've done research and interviewed people. In this case, what you're saying is Fletcher worked there. Here's what he did from day to day. And he tells you firsthand about his experiences and also opinions. And he doesn't step out, you know, from a, an arm's length. You know, he says, listen, if the other guy was in that operation and he's not writing about it, why should I talk about that? So what he does talk about is groundbreaking enough, but you know it was the tip of the iceberg. And um, just thank goodness that we have this insight from Fletcher for people to reflect on when they try to understand the Kennedy assassination, the Bay of Pigs, the background between this resistance in opposition to Kennedy when he starts laying it out and you know one of your great questions was if you were in charge that day what would you do you know and Fletcher just starts going through it and in a half an hour I think he he winds up by saying you know uh if the police had done the normal job that day uh, by the end of the day we would have known something was up and there would be none of this lone nut and that whole sort of approach to changing the story of what happened <clears throat> has been repeated numerous times, not just in United States 20th century history, but certainly we know times in our own life that that's happened. This is certainly one of them. And if there's, if there's been the kind of 
shenanigans and manipulation of powers in other countries through assassination or espionage or anything that basically turns things so that the outcome favors the corporate interests that essentially define United States uh, structures both of government and of uh, policy, then why wouldn't that same type of anything that it takes to get the wind to go your way occur right here at, in the heart of that amazing uh, concentration of wealth and uh, influence and power to uh, have something. Fletcher always talked about the one of the most important things was not necessarily the act itself of, say, something like an assassination of a president like with Kennedy, but the cover-up and the cover story that were organized long before so that the, the story that would ensue after the event would be tight enough that it would hold together. And he pointed out more than once in our interview that one indication of the, of the strength of the plotters and the the power that they wielded was that the cover-up has held. And, of course, the cover-up continues to hold. And, and that's been a lot coming up on 50 years now. And that's an indication of the depth of control and of influence <clears throat> that continues to operate and run things largely out of view of any of the sort of players on the stage that get paraded around as if that's more of the reality of what's going on when so much of it is sort of a dog and pony show or a bread and circuses that keeps people entertained, but it doesn't ever really touch upon the deeper, the deeper questions that many, many, many people know are there, but the, what the, the, the influence of the one speaking to the many, the kind of corporate commercial press that is more and ever more concentrated as we go through the decades and the sort of plutocratic form of influence and direction that continues to proceed. I mean, it, it's, it, it's very tight and it's very, very centralized in certain ways. John Judge would also be want to point out that there are competing interests in this group of uh, different uh, people that either through wealth or through influence ha exert a tremendous uh, uh, power on events. Peter Dale Scott with his, uh, I was finally four years later this past fall starting to read The Road to 9-11, and he wrote it in 2007, it took him six years to write it, and his whole sense of not just the underworld, but the overworld, and he's a magnificent writer, and, and so much of what he uh, co collates and, and collects from all of his different reading, and, and, you know, of course, if you read any of his books, you have to read, you have to keep track with all the footnotes that are going by, because the reach of what he's drawing upon to substantiate basically the frame of what he's presenting and how he's writing about is absolutely extraordinary, and you'd never see practically any of that in any significant, meaningful way, in any kind of commercial press publication, a newspaper or a journal or a periodical, because it's, it's, it's just too much up against the control that is being exerted, the mind control, the, the management of perceptions, which the great uh, PR firms like Burston, Marstell are out of Germany, but it's global, they're all global at this point, exert to influence the way people think things are. If you can shackle people's minds with television and other things, why do you need boxcars and, and extermination camps? <clears throat> I, I'm, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that's rather cynical in some ways, but unfortunately there's some of that that is just the way our world is. This distraction, I guess, is what you're getting at, is a, a self-fulfilling prophecy because <laughs> as long as people keep getting distracted to watch... Uh, the Housewives of Beverly Hills or something like that, television keeps saying, well, we're going to keep making it because they keep yeah. watching it. <laughs> that is part of the distraction to keep people from thinking about asking big questions of what's going on in your life. And you think, well, how the hell can I get a handle on the whole world and be there to suggest a more positive 
outcome and and have people walk towards some better goal when I you know I, I can't even get a hand on uh, on local politics you know never mind yeah. global right so but you know the thing about Fletcher was that he seemed very worldly and he w- was able to handle any topic you know just like that at, at the snap of your fingers and he traveled I think in over 80 countries he was a, a real insider in the clandestine network so he really had an idea of how the world works and by me going through many many interviews a couple of things stick out one is one of my favorite and I don't mean favorite I mean just very illuminating but understated uh, article was called anatomy of an assassination and I'm not sure if it's just the article or his lecture but at one point he was kind of talking to the to a crowd which I'm not sure was really getting him and he was talking about this network and the power structure you're talking about and he said where is your power where is your power before you even attempt these things like a removal of government? You know what I mean? You have to, you have to know you're sitting on top of this power base. And then mm. the other thing was that several times he had mentioned the idea of these squads. And in the case of, of Kennedy, if, if we're going to subscribe to that this was a military, i, I got to be careful how I phrase it, but it was an, an organized effort to remove Kennedy that was done in a professional manner. That means it was well thought out, different scenarios. You know, it, it wasn't the first time guys like Lansdale or other people would have had a removal of government. So they knew what they were doing. And on and, and many occasions, I'd heard him kind of talk to people to see if they, if they caught this. He would say that, look, at you know in the prison system when someone's been gone to a jury trial and they had their appeals and then they're sentenced to death, there's somebody that's an executioner there. And he might be somebody's neighbor. He might be a Boy Scout leader. He's a guy in the block watch. He's a regular, you know, mature adult, gone to university maybe. But his job is, when called upon, to remove that person from society, you know, and, and whatever the, the crime is. And he was hinting at, to me, you know, this is what goes on as well, that in the ranks of this big power, they have teams that are like that, that train, prepare, that's their job. When called upon, and it's extremely professional, and these kind of people do not talk. So that's another thing that I picked up about it that I never find anyone writing about or, or even hinting at that say, you have to understand this isn't just a lone nut or crazy mafia guy or so, uh, one or two Cubans that were pissed off, you know, that somehow, you know, the Bay of Pigs and all that, that they said we're going to get them. No, this is so well oiled machine that that's the kind of, you know, that's one angle that I got from Fletcher that he had, he'd, you know, said and hinted to different people I had copied, found many, many interviews from people over the years. And uh, I think that that was one of the things he was trying to drive home, that people in society for, for big power, where is your power? They have someone they can pick up the phone and say, this guy's got to go. We've had enough. Yep. And that's probably well, an uncomfortable thought for people new to the case and that they're, they're hoping it's just... <laughs> a lone nut or, or a friend of Jack Ruby or something. They're thinking, well, we'll find out what happened. They, it, It's rather uncomfortable to see where the whole thing leads. Well, and, and it's also the effect now, <clears throat> the power of words, if, if it ever comes up and I'm talking with someone these years, which doesn't happen as often because of the line of work I'm in now, self-employed. But if you bring up something that touches upon the aspect of the conspiratorial nature of some sort of event or some type of uh, group, or at least uh, some sort of historical precedent that has certain certain kinds of authors have written about certain kinds of uh, people that always show up again and again and again in certain of these things, particularly in the United States post World War II. And you say conspiracy, and, and somebody is immediately, or practically immediately, going to say, well, that's a conspiracy theory. And not that they're necessarily putting down what you're saying, but the, the, the pervasiveness of how much it's no longer, you can't really bring that word up without somebody thinking of it as being a double word. It, it, it's a conspiracy theory, like that's a single word. So something like that is very powerful for exerting... Uh, uh, an influence on people's perceptions and their awareness of things. And, and they may not be aware really consciously themselves that they're subscribing to that, but it's just so ubiquitous in the culture that is a very effective way of 
maintaining control where people don't feel able or or it doesn't occur to them or they're afraid of being called a kook or, or whatever whatever the range of things that causes people to not go there just in their own thoughts. I mean, that's pretty close to the kind of world Orwell wrote about. Yeah, well, I prefer to, to if anybody asks me about this, I say it's political research. Yeah. And then the backlash is you get the guys like Cass Sunstein that are trying to say, oh, the people who believe in Bigfoot and 9-11 and all that, you know, we've got to ban their websites and block that from this, this uh, uh, I mean, he, he's even more Machiavellian, you know. I can't believe it that guy's writing anything. You, you're aware of Cass Sunstein at all? Barely. Okay, well, I mean, they always have these, uh, these quote, professors to come out to, to poke holes in research that may, may be flawed, you know, theories of what in 9-11 or the Kennedy assassination or, or anything, right? But they tie it right away to UFOs, alien abductions. I mean, right now they're, uh, they're on the bandwagon of, of vaccinations. Now people have just got to trust doctors and, you know, it reminds me of the old 50s shows when you'd see a doctor come on in a smock and a stethoscope and he'd say, I prefer camels and here's the cigarette I prefer, you know, doctor recommended. Yeah. Uh, so I can change. That's my, you know, feeling on vaccinations and the cocktails they have. I mean, if you said, here's one, here's one for mumps. Okay, fine, you know. But they're giving you 17 at once mm-hmm. or more. And of course, it's a phenomenal moneymaker. And it's a. Well, we're getting off the topic, though. But tell me a little more about your time with Fletcher that era when you were sitting down with him every day because I remember the first time I, I went to see him I was uh, you know I was just ecstatic I thought my goodness this guy had worked in the Pentagon he'd mingled with the top people and here I'm able to ask him questions uh, he's very rare I don't think you you know phone up Bob McNamara or anybody and say listen here's some questions I'd like to meet with you can we go out for lunch can we do anything you know what I mean and and have any headway with anyone of that era and I, I can't think of anybody else in the same boat. So uh, in one way, you must have felt lucky about that. Oh, of course. I. It was. This was right on the heels, <clears throat> within a couple of years, of the whole Iran-Contra debacle, debacle that had uh, made some kind of ripples in House hearings, televised hearings, that were reminiscent of the Watergate-era hearings. And w- there were certainly things that came up that we talked about regarding Oliver North or whatever, that Fletcher felt he saw. He'd already been out of government at that point. He resigned on January 1st, 1964. So this is 25 years later. But he still, he drew upon things. He he saw them. Cappy Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense, Casper, or whoever else talking about the 1932 Economy Act, he understood exactly what Weinberger was referring to because things like that don't go out of date. There's things from decades before that they used in the 50s and 60s when he was running, help doing logistical support for uh, covert operations globally, first for the Air Force and then all the branches of the military. And he knew intimately about the different uh, acts of Congress or whatever else that were used to hide how the money got spent and make it look like it was from the Air Force when it was for the CIA or whatever, on and on and on. So he, he knew, and he saw those things still happening in the 80s, uh, that he was, he understood the, the subtext of what was actually being referred to when somebody was referring to something related to a mess 20 years later with Iran Contra. And so that was sort of the era things were in. Obviously, nothing like the world that we find ourselves in now, really, as far as in some ways how, how warped things have become in the U.S. Uh, yeah, you know, I hate to cut you off, but I recall a conversation, just what you're talking about in there, where you, I don't know if you were joking with him, telling him no one would know this, and he said, yeah, I should have called, what was his name, Lawrence Welch? L- Larry Welch? Yeah, Welch, Welch. Right. Yeah, so he's saying, I, I thought about I should have phoned him and really told him how the things were, but, you know, I better not get into that debacle. And, and <laughs> could you imagine the schooling that uh, he would have got from Fletcher in about a half-hour phone call? Well, I, I think there have been numerous times when people like that, people like Fletcher, with with a background that he had from firsthand experience, who might have, in whatever ways, 
contacted whomever that was in whatever committee, wherever, running some type of investigation or writing a report. And there are, there are other evidences of times when stuff like that was simply taken in and then nothing was done with it, or it was sat on, or it was ignored, or, or it was even twisted somehow in whatever way, because it went against the grain of what the purpose of this what, whichever so-called investigation that was set up to basically put some kind of official imprimatur or, or, or stamp on something as the Kennedy assassination or 9-11 or Iran-Contra or Watergate or whatever else that uh, would, would keep things, the, the limited hangout, so that there would be some kind of supposed conclusion that uh, forever after, seemingly, uh, officials or just plain people could point to and say, see, that's what it said, that's what, that's what happened. But people like Fletcher, who could have, who, and I'm sure did at different times, give their two bits for things that they thought, you're missing the point here, that's not what this or that is really about. Uh, I, I do think that the people that ran those committees and those commissions, they had their marching orders, they basically knew what was in bounds and what was out of bounds. And if someone like Fletcher had called up at any time to give the piece of their peace of mind and their perspective on what they saw really happening, they might be polite to them and, and listen, you know, listen for as long as this person wanted to talk and either take notes or not. But that I don't see how they would have possibly considered that they were going to alter their frame because they it was not going to go the way that their conclusions were supposed to be drawn. So many of those reports were just, they had a preconceived idea of what they were supposed to produce at the end, and that's when they went for it. And anything else that got in the way of that, they just either ignored it or, or you know, uh, twisted it or, or whatever so that it wouldn't interfere with the purpose of the um, study or, or gathering or committee or whatever it was. <clears throat> You're right. Even Fletcher would have had a whole bunch to tell Walsh. He, he, he understood many things that at that time for me, I, I followed Iran Contra pretty heavily, and I was younger then, and I was very focused on a lot of that stuff, of course, because I went to go see Fletcher Prouty. I knew at the time, after I'd read The Secret Team, this is, this is really sick. I can't really follow a lot of this, but the opportunity to talk to the guy who wrote all this, and he's writing about first-person experience, yeah, that sounds great. Let me let me go talk to him and record our conversation. I'd love to do that. That's that's about as much of a purpose as I had at the time, and it it developed over time to become something else. But yeah, I was very very pleased that he was interested to talk to me, and I got the sense from John that he was like that because it just was in that time in the '80s. There were there were some people who would contact him, but a lot of people just. They might have known about him, but they didn't necessarily think to, to you know, contact him and say, can I meet with you? And those of us who did, he said, sure, come on. If he sensed that the person was genuinely interested, if he, he told me a different, you know, whatever people, and he could tell when they would contact him, that they had whatever other kind of axe to grind or something, he wasn't, some of them I, I think he did talk with, but a lot of them he sensed, no, they're not genuine. They're, 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 they're doing something else here that's not above board. Yeah, and the first time I met him, we met in a restaurant, and he, you know, confided to me later. He said, "Listen, I meet with someone. Uh, we'll go to like Joe Theismann's or, or somewhere else that was a restaurant in Washington. And then if I don't like the guy, you know, I can just you know say goodbye, shake hands, and leave, right?" Yeah. Of course, uh, he invited us back to his home right after that, so I was just thrilled that I thought, well, this is good that uh, the kind of research and the questions that. I was following up with were not just someone walking into him and saying, oh, who killed Kennedy? And yeah, how's that, right? You know, and right. Uh, when I first wrote him a letter, I left that question off. I, I had overheard that in another conversation that somebody had taped with him. And I thought, this is great then. I've got this tidbit. If I was going to ask somebody questions about that era, like spokes on a wheel, that will be the center. So I'm going to ask 20 questions around there that if I get those questions answered, it will be obvious uh, what's going on, right? And uh, yeah, you no, know, you know, or as much as you can. I shouldn't just say obvious, but uh, and, and uh, you know, that's my recollection of Fletcher as well. That uh, you know, if you were just you had an honest interest 
and you didn't have a preconceived notion because some of these things he was talking about, you know, like, like you're talking about Iran-Contra, and you get right into it, and you think you know what's going on, and he says, are you kidding me? You know, $50 billion, or, uh, you know. and uh, they A were cake selling, and a Bible. Yeah, right, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, um, as well, Gary Powers' flight, the idea yep. of oil, so many things you say, well, wait a minute, that's not what I've heard at all. How, how can that be? And just as the, the further I dug into these things, it seemed that, no, you know, he had his finger on the pulse of what was going on. And uh, when he told me something, uh, you know, I could start doing further research. And uh, it just led to me making a CD-ROM and more work for him to pay him back because I, I never dreamed I'd meet someone like Fletcher that was that wise and knowledgeable level-handed like i say uh i was on a talk show with him one time where I, uh, the host just said please you know give us a name tell us somebody who was involved in the assassination let us go with it and he said that's not how it's going to work if there's ever going to be an official trial where the citizens of the united states care about this and there's going to be taken down in court and our testimony will be taken seriously me and others would come out of the woodwork but until yeah. then we're not going to go on a talk show and just name names because what would it do and he'd already thought that through he elaborated further on that yeah. one i think that guy's name was uh archimedes that was in san jose anyway it's on the cd rom that one but it was a good answer it was like you know nothing will be solved if i just say a name you know bob mcnamara you know he did it you know what what'll happen nothing so you guys have to do research and decide if anyone's going to lay any charges is there enough evidence is there any uh, willpower i mean the city of dallas the state of texas uh, you know, they don't care for it. And as a matter of fact, what's worse, the sixth floor, well, I hate to call it a museum, but, you know, Gary Mack and those guys, it's the headquarters of the cover-up. What they have done is they want to take all the blame away from Dallas and Texas. Yeah. And if they can pin it on one lone nut, that means it's off their back that weight that, you know, somehow the city was complicit, uh, the FBI there, the CIA, the Secret Service, all those people organizations that were entrusted to keep a president alive all turned their back that day and let another team come in and have them removed. And they were only too happy to go along with the cover-up and uh, Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover and all those guys and uh, you know, Alan Dulles. I mean, even just the, like if you said to someone, oh, well, Alan Dulles, you know, the guy Kennedy fired, is uh, on the Warren Commission. Oh, and by the way, his deputy director, Charles Cabell, his brother was the mayor of Dallas at the time, right? I mean, just coincidence, though. Yeah. That's about size of it. <clears throat> yeah. Well, all I can do is suggest and endorse your book, Understanding Special Operations, and as well, from your website, uh, I'll make links to it, but your audio interviews are there, and the book is there, and it's the companion to the secret team. So if you've read the secret team, you're interested at all? Uh, Skyhorse Publishing has reprinted it, so you can get the book. Also, I believe that Fletcher had entrusted you to keep that alive. It, that the secret team actually is on your website as well. That's right. So, I urge people: it's worth reading. It's worth picking up the understanding from someone who was there, not something you know, not other people who are interviewing X guy this or someone worked there. Here's Fletcher. It's his own words first-hand account he wrote the book you know agree with them disagree with them but I really suggest people read that to get up to speed and then the companion to that is Dave Ratcliffe understanding special operations which is a week with Fletcher but also a lot of letters and phone calls in between going over that to shape this into uh, a great companion well I, I felt at the time that it did offer a expansion of his writing was very dense he needed to read it multiple times to pick up on things that you wouldn't necessarily understand the first time you went through the relationship of something he's talking about earlier in the book with something that comes up later uh, multiple passes to get a better overall gestalt of the of the overall frame of what he's presenting and so the understanding of special operations was basically uh, something to expand on certain things. He was still alive. He was very much ab absolutely clear still in everything to do with his mind, his memory, all of that with everything that he'd done in his professional life and everything that he'd written about and more. And 
so it, it extends that book um, that uh, ask you know ask him to elaborate on this that or the other aspect of it i I wanted to have the the interview be primarily him i didn't want to I wanted to pose questions and just let him go and and not try as much as I could to not interrupt a train of thought that he might be having so that I could bring out as much of whatever he wanted to say at all about anything uh, with as little interference from me as possible. <clears throat> well, well, you mentioned about how, how sharp his mind was even uh, you know, in, in an elderly age. And I have a funny anecdote. I may have told you before, but for anybody who didn't hear this, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, I mean, just Fletcher's subtle sense of humor. I got a letter, and I used to read the letters to him. I got a bunch of them, and, and it says, uh, uh, Fletcher, uh, here's when someone says that uh, Fletcher doesn't know what he's talking about anymore, and he's, you can't trust what he's writing. <laughs> and he sat there for a second. He says, well, you tell him I wrote the book in 72, and I felt fine then. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. He was, he was not even 10 years out of government when he wrote that. Okay. So now, Dave, I wanted to turn this over to you a bit because you had you know last time we had you on you were talking about Julian Assange and how how important this freedom of the internet was going to get and the battle that's happening and it seems to have come around now that can you imagine if America is going to try to extradite Julian Assange and and all that WikiLeaks stuff I mean it's a, a whole other topic but since you seem to be ahead of the curve in some of these things which I'm very interested in you mentioned you wanted to talk about something that I'm not familiar with, and I'm probably some of our listeners are, are not, and that is um, nuclear power in Finland. And a, is it a movie, a filmmaker? Yes, I, yeah, actually, I'm I'm a little bit behind on this. I I had been from about 2006. I had been or 2005. The I'd worked on the website that Fletcher's book is on, and other things. It's called Ratical.org, R-A-T-I-C-A-L.org, since about 1994 to 2004. And I took a hiatus, hiatus because I just had more things in my personal life that I really needed to attend to and get on with. And then came March last year, and the world was introduced to Fukushima. And it really grabbed my attention from the moment I read that there were these initial hydrogen explosions at some of the different uh, reactors. And I knew, well, that, that's not what they're saying. That's a very, very significant event, what's going on. So Fukushima really drew me back into beginning to actually try and spend a little time again uh, chronicling and archiving and sifting what I was seeing come through the press and you know electronically throughout the world about Fukushima. And in doing so, that's, that started me right then at the second weekend in March of last year. And Chernobyl, the 25th, 25th anniversary of Chernobyl was coming up in April, and I have a there's a large section on radical uh, called the health effects of low level ionizing radiation. And there's a lot of stuff in there. I put my heart and soul into that for 10 years, as well as other things on the site. And I I updated the Chernobyl site. There's a Chernobyl section of the radiation component of the site. There was a new book that came out in 2009 published by the New York Academy of Sciences. Very, very, very significant book on Chernobyl. Chernobyl Consequences of the Catastrophe for People in the Environment by three Russian authors, Yablokov and two people whose last name is Nestorenko. It was published by the U.S. Academy of Sciences, a very, very hardcore U.S. scientific organization. It was not uh, printed for very long, and it, uh, from what I understand from talking to some people afterwards, the economy of science has kind of got in over its head, and it didn't really intend for this book to go the way it went. Um, I followed on with that. There's a whole section in the Chernobyl part of the radiation section that has different reviews of this book. I made a transcript of an interview with the consulting editor, editor Jeanette D. Sherman, who was the American English-speaking person who went through the whole book. It's an amazing account that basically puts the figure for the loss of life so far uh, in Chernobyl close to a million people dying. Now, that's very, very different from what you'd hear from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. And it, it's, uh, it's an amazing read. It's really rather astonishing. It's very, very well documented and they draw upon a tremendous amount of research that has been done primarily in Russia and Eastern Europe 
from non-speaking scientists and medical doctors who were doing on-the-ground studies themselves. So I was doing all that last spring. And then, and I, and then I found my way to a couple of sites that were doing ongoing reporting on Fukushima and other things to do with the radioactive contamination of, of Earth, a la present day 2011. And at that point, I saw this uh, trailer come by on a site called beyondnuclear.org, a site that Helen Caldicott helped set up, Dr. Helen Caldicott, of a movie called Into Eternity. And I, I looked at the trailer, and I was very curious about it. And I, and I minimally looked at it and felt like, oh, well, okay, so the movie got released in Europe in 2010, and it was released in the United States in New York right in February of 2011, right before Fukushima. And the movie... Uh, at the time, I, I kind of looked at it, and I didn't see an easy way that I could get a copy of it, so I sort of just gave up on it. And then there's a wonderful uh, website from a woman in California. She runs a website called TUC Radio, Time of Useful Consciousness. Her name is Maria Gallardin. She's extremely capable as a journalist, as an audio production person. She makes these weekly radio broadcasts, and they are magnificent. And in there, I uh, found these wonderful interviews. She, she rebroadcast an interview that Helen Caldicott did with Michael Madsen, the director and the writer of this movie, Into Eternity. He's Danish. And the movie is a documentary. And I, it's, it's out of this world. It's, it's an hour and 25, 75 minutes long. And he basically, he's a very, very creative, uh, incredibly insightful person, artist, filmmaker, he, he frames the movie in terms of he's the narrator and it's as if he's talking to an audience far, far in the future. Because what the movie is about is the first uh, long-term, permanent nuclear repository for high-level nuclear waste. Uh, they tried to do one in the United States, the Yucca Mountain. It failed technologically and politically. This one is in Finland, and the Finnish government created a uh, process where they would get bids from companies. And the uh, repository began to be built, I'm not, I'm not remembering exactly when it started, but it is supposed to take 120 years to complete. And what the repository will do will be to store about 1,500 feet down in bedrock on an island uh, off the uh, Finnish coast in the Baltic Sea, the 6,500 tons of high-level radioactive waste that is in the nuclear power plants in Finland at this point and within the next 100 years. They've rated it. There's one new reactor that's starting, that's being built that is not going to be included in this site, but everything else estimated right now up through the next hundred years will be put into casks in containers in this uh, repository deep in the ground and sealed in the 22nd century in 2120 I believe everyone who's working on it now no one who is working on it now will be alive to see that and the site itself is engineered and intended to last for 100,000 years and he goes in in this movie, he's, he's writing about, he's, he's presenting it as, as the narrator, as if he's talking to people 50,000 years from now, about this time. And it's a very interesting way to produce a narrative that helps establish a different frame of reference or perspective than just ourselves in our own time. There's a couple of quotes from the movie. He, as the narrator, at one point, he's saying, Onkelo is the name of the repository on this island. Onkelo must last 100,000 years. Nothing built by man has lasted even a tenth of that time span. If we succeed, Onkelo will most likely be the longest lasting remains of our civilization. If you sometime far into the future find this, what will it tell you about us? And for the last 25 plus years, I've been very aware and concerned and disturbed about the whole development of nuclear technology, primarily power and weapons, essentially power, because that was supposed to be the, the civilian peace, peaceful use of the atom that started uh, to be described that way and presented that way in the Eisenhower years. <clears throat> but 
the, the length, the, the half-life length of these elements that get created in the reactor cores that are used for nothing more than to heat water, to turn a turbine, to generate electricity, th there's practically every known element in the universe at different times is created in those fissioning processes in the reactors. And they change as, as time goes by because they are unstable. That's what radioactive matter is. It, it does not hold a certain chemical bonding uh, composition according to the periodic table of the elements. So things throw off electrons or throw off neutrons, and they change, and there's different types of radioactive matter. And I'm not a physicist, but I've always read about this stuff, and it, and it just concerns me very much. And so reading more about this movie, the interview that Helen Caldicott did with Michael Madsen, the director, that I'm just now, I've got her permission. She runs a radio program called If You Love This Planet. It's run out of Australia. And I wrote and asked permission to create an annotated transcript of the interview she did with him in July of last year in the summer. Very, very, very interesting conversation they had for an hour. And she gave me permission. So I'm now pretty much almost finished with the second pass. I have three passes to make going through it. And then I will put in footnotes and links and things to what they're referring to. And that'll be in the section of the site right now. It's under the radiation health costs of nuclear technology section. There's a new section that I've created along with Fukushima last spring called Radioactivity and the Systematic Falsification of Nuclear Risk. And this movie about the first attempt to actually make a permanent repository and the questions that it raises about, but how are we going to have something that is made to last for longer than we, for 100,000 years at a minimum? In the United States, the uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the DOE, when they were looking at Erica Mountain, were looking at needing to make it last for a million years. Plutonium's half-life is a quarter of a million years but some people have different ways of interpreting how you would actually multiply that out by a factor of 10 or a factor of 20 to come up with the true time it would take for highly toxic, lethal, radioactive materials to become inert because of the passage of so much time. And so there's a, this woman, Maria Gillard, and she has a wonderful extra uh, half-hour radio program on Onkelo into Eternity that she produced right around the same time she did um, some months back of the interview that she rebroadcast of Helen Caldicott interviewing Michael Madsen. And from her half-an-hour one, I, I'm starting to make notes from that because it's very, very interesting as well. I'm, I'm asking her if I can also make a transcript of that. She's writing about what are 100,000 years in relation to known history. Onkelo is being designed to far outlast any structure or institution ever created by mankind. Since it is so difficult to predict the future, we usually look back. And considering time spans like the Great Pyramid of Giza was completed around 4,500 years ago. The transition from nomadic hunter-gathering to farming and permanent settlement occurred between seven and 10,000 years ago. The last Ice Age was 20,000 years ago. Our Homo sapiens ancestors only reached Europe 40,000 years ago, where Neanderthals did not become extinct until 30,000 years ago. And the great original Homo sapiens migrations out of Africa took place between 125 and 60,000 years ago. So what they're building now, it's not just that they're building a bunker, basically, that's going to hold this very, very toxic material that needs to be kept out of the biosphere for an, in, an unimaginably long amount of time. The, the, the concern, even beyond that, is you, so you think this thing will, will need to be undisturbed for at least 100,000 years, but what if someone, someday, someone finds evidence of something buried there? Well, when they found the pyramids and they ignored all the warnings about not breaching its contents, that didn't stop human curiosity from wanting to know what's inside of there. So one of the things the engineers and the other people who are working on Onkelo are trying to figure out is, how should we make a marker? What, what should it try and impart? Because language won't necessarily be anything that's recognizable in the future at all, certainly not on that kind of time span. Uh, how could we make a marker that would last anyways? 
what could it say, or do we actually go the route of trying to make it so that it's hidden enough, and onkelo in Finnish means hiding place, hidden enough that it somehow we forget to remember that it's there and it's never found. One other point in the film, Michael Madsen, as the narrator, says, my civilization depends on energy as no civilization before us. Energy is the main currency for us. Is it the same for you? Because he's talking to the future. Does your way of life also depend on unlimited energy? A hundred thousand years is beyond our understanding and imagination. Our history is so short in comparison. How is it with you? How far into the future will your way of life have consequences? He's making incredibly interesting frames of looking at something that whether somebody is for or against nuclear power, the fact is there's something, the figures I've read are between 250,000 and 400,000 tons of high-level nuclear waste on the planet now from the reactors that are scattered across the globe that are all over the place. And the, the, the high-level waste that's, that's been taken out of the reactors is, sits in these cooling pools. It has to cool for 40 to 60 years to get it down so it's about 100 degrees Celsius or less so that it can then be handled and put transferred into more stable, long-term containers that can then be transported to take to some type of repository where it can be buried, where it can basically, the attempt can be made to try to keep it out of the biosphere for how long? And uh, Madsen's telling Helen Caldicott was the scientists that he spoke with who were involved with this thing as he was making the documentary. One of them pointed out, well, whether you're talking about 100,000 years, like Finland says, or a million years, like the U.S. says, you're talking about something that is essentially forever. It is eternity. Because human conception of anything that vast is is inconceivable. It, it's not... W w w our sense of time is so different from that. But we, by our own... of uh, working with, you know, the tool maker that we are, we are creating this incredible amount of material that is inimical to all life, not just human, but any kind of biological life on this very, very precious single home we all inhabit. <clears throat> and, and, and as uh, Madsen points out further on as, as he's uh, narrating, Onkelo is our very first permanent repository for nuclear waste. But when Onkelo is sealed a century from now, it will hold only a fraction of the waste we have. We must build many more onkelos far from earthquakes and volcanoes to keep the waste away from the surface of the earth. We must build many more secret chambers that we hope to hide from you. It, it is the scope of what he is uh, exploring here in this movie is, is very, very, very relevant. This guy, uh, Peter Bradshaw, he writes in the British Guardian in November of 2010 about the film. One of the most extraordinary factual films to be shown this year. Madsen's film does not merely ask tough questions about the implications of nuclear energy, but also how we, as a race, conceive our own future. This is nothing less than post-human architecture we are talking about. Why isn't every government, every philosopher every theologian, everybody, everywhere in the world discussing Onkelo and its in implications. I, I, I think it's just so germane to all of the things. It, it makes other things that we think about in some ways pale by comparison. There's this guy, um, I'm almost done. There's this guy uh, named Alexander. He writes something in a, on a blog called Soft Morning City where he's talking about the movie and Onkelo. Onkelo is probably the most ambitious human endeavor ever put into practice, and in its quiet, reflective style, the film, Into Eternity, presents the project in its full madness. It makes us consider the big questions in a way that we, in the 21st century, don't usually do outside of theological and philosophical circles. Questions of war, economic collapse, mass migration, ecological catastrophe, 
social structure, all seem to pale away when we are faced with a time period that, in reverse, stretches back tens of thousands of years beyond our recorded history to when Homo sapiens or modern humans were not the only species of human on this earth. This is an idea that is almost inconceivable to us now. And yet, it's, of course, so relevant and relative to everything that we are about on the planet and, and what we're supposedly for to make the world a better place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as, as Maria Gallardin at one point asks the very, very pointed question, how far ahead can we burden the Earth and future generations by turning on the lights? Because, of course, there's a great many places on the planet that use power that's coming from nuclear reactors. They're there. The, the very, near the very end of the film, the last thing I'll talk about here, it's a very, very powerful moment. Michael Matson, he, he strikes a match, and, and he's there in sort of the darkness with this match. There's a lot of filming in the Onkelo facility that is very amazing, this, these huge caverns and all this work that's going on there. He strikes a match, and he says, Once upon a time, man learned to master fire, something no other living creature had done before him. Man conquered the entire world. One day he found a new fire, a fire so powerful that it could never be extinguished. Man reveled in the thought that he now possessed the powers of the universe. Then in horror, he realized that his new fire could not only create, but also destroy. Not only could it burn on land, but inside all living creatures, inside his children, the animals, all crops. Man looked around for help, but found none. And so he built a burial chamber deep in the bowels of the earth, a hiding place for the fire to burn into eternity. Well, it certainly got my interest, and I'm going to have to watch that film. It's pretty extraordinary. The thing I'm making inside of uh, radical.org slash radiation slash radioactivity, I hope to have it out by this weekend or the beginning of next week. There's three sections in it, radiation and health, what is actually going on here, and conflict of interest, health versus nuclear industry promotion. The what is actually going on here is a new section that I'm just starting now, which for now is going to have the transcript of the interview of Helen Caldicott with Michael Madsen, and I hope possibly also the half-hour transcript of the half-hour broadcast of Maria Gillardin, of her basically synopsizing and take, uh, recording, uh, rebroadcasting elements of the film. It's, it's incredibly uh, significant. I, I think it's, it's something that is, is very useful for anyone to in any way be exposed to and to think about and talk about with other people. Um, I don't know how uh, much around the film is these days, but it is at least available on DVD. It, it costs quite a bit unless you can figure out a way to have somebody who works in a school buy a copy for you for 90 bucks. Highly, highly worth it if you can get your hands on one. Um, it's a very, very significant film, and I encourage everybody to find out what they can about Into Eternity and about Onkelo. Well, once again, uh, I always learn, and I'm looking forward to the next time we can talk again. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Dave, it's Thank you a, very much. For the yeah, a pleasure to speak to you always. It's great that at least we get together at least on Fletcher's birthday, you know, that kind of thing, yep. and uh, yep. talk about the world we live in. Just keep up the good work. And, Thanks very um, much. And I'll be looking forward to speaking to you again. And I'll make links. Besides my interviews, I have all the links, so whatever I can find about the film and other things, I'll, I'll do that as well. And as very well good. as understanding special operations. Good. All right, then. Until very next good, time. Very good, Evelyn. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. Okay. Good night. Black Op Radio presents Colonel L. Fletcher Prouding, the DVD complete collection. Finally, the DVD set you've been waiting for is available. Over 15 hours with Colonel L. Fletcher Prouding. Over 15 hours. Over 15 hours. Over 15 hours. Interviews with Leno Sanic, John Judge, David Ratcliffe, and more. This is a one of a kind set. These interviews feature Fletcher Prouty having candid conversations regarding his 23 years in the military, but specifically nine years in the Pentagon from 1955 to 1964. 
This inside knowledge is invaluable to researchers of this era of American and world history. These are the revelations you've been waiting for. Over 15 hours with Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, the complete DVD collection. Available at the Colonel Prouty reference site, www.prouty.org and blackopradio.com. We can now say with moral certainty and considerable scientific authority that the death of JFK was committed by a meticulously executed conspiracy which was obscured by an extensive cover-up. Cover up. Murder in Dealey Plaza, edited by James Fetzer, goes to the heart of the JFK assassination. You'll read new and up-to-date information regarding the Secret Service, the Lincoln limousine, the medical evidence, the cover-up, altering the film, framing the patsy, and the silent historians. Also, 16 smoking guns, each one crushing the government's lone assassin scenario. A world-class chronology of November 22nd, 1963. Chapters by David W. Mantic, Gary Aguilar, Vincent Palomara, Douglas Weldon, Jack White, Ira David Wood III, James H. Fetzer, Doug Horn, and a classic essay by Bertrand Russell. The complete story in the pages of one single book, edited by James H. Fetzer. Read it now. Read it again. You'll use it as a reference. Murder in Dealey Plaza. Available at Amazon.com and major bookstores around the world. It's murder. It's a political rally. A free speech zone. A town hall meeting. It's an interrogation at NSA headquarters. Now, it's time to make a statement. Time to represent. Time to let them know who you are. That you're part of the Black Op. With a brand new Black Op Radio t-shirt. Comes in all sizes. Wear it loud and proud. Join the Black Op today. www.blackopradio.com Even Bush admits that Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. Our own FBI acknowledged it has no hard evidence that ties Osama bin Laden to 9-11. But if Saddam had nothing to do with 9-11, and if Osama had nothing to do with 9-11, then who did it? Who did it? The 9-11 conspiracy provides the answer. Discover the big picture. Learn what we know now. Find out what it means. Eleven experts contribute to exposing the truth as the anatomy of an atrocity. Edited by James H. Fetzer. Buy it now if you have the courage to face the truth. Just don't think you're going to like it. If you believe there's more to the JFK assassination and the mystery surrounding the CIA and its covert operations, you're not alone. Meet the man Oliver Stone called X in the epic motion picture JFK. Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty comes forward with never-before-seen or heard documentation and information about JFK, the Vietnam War, the CIA, and more on a brand new CD-ROM. The collected works of Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty is an incredible offer not to be missed. For a limited time only, find the answers surrounding these issues and more with the collected works of Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. Or visit the Colonel Prouty reference site on the World Wide Web. The collected works of Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. Stem cell research. Abortion. Cloning. Cloning. Evolution. Creation science. Intelligent design. These are hot button issues today. Religion and science. Morality and government. Corporations and fascism. and fascism. If you want to know what's happening to this nation this very day, then you won't want to miss Render, Render unto Darwin. Darwin. After 35 years of teaching logic, critical thinking, and scientific reasoning, Jim Fetzer offers a critique of the Christian rights crusade against science. If you want to understand the issues, if you want to be informed, 
This is a book you won't want to miss. Render Unto Darwin at Amazon.com and the major bookstores. Render Unto Darwin. Interviews with Colonel Al Fletcher Prouty. Secrets of the YouTube Flight. We are pleased to announce Volume 1 of Interviews with Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty on DVD. This first one-hour DVD goes through the 1960 U-2 incident with Gary Powers. Colonel Fletcher Prouty reveals his inside knowledge of the incident, his office in the Pentagon, Operation Aquatone, Soviet overflights, and the similar Alan Pope incident. It is Prouty's position that the U-2 flight was sabotaged by the members of a secret team to stop the crusade for peace and embarrass President Eisenhower, thereby heating up the Cold War. And, of course, Eisenhower warned everyone of the industrialized military complex that he had learned of firsthand in this incident. You will learn Gary Powers' U-2 never was shot down at 70,000 feet, as claimed in every single history book. Four separate interviews on one DVD, a -a one-of-a-kind must-have for anyone interested in finding the truth behind the cover story. Interviews with Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. Secrets of the U-2 Flight.